that into. All right, welcome everyone to this week's episode of CRNA School Prep Academy podcast. Today, I have a very special host and or guest, I should say, is Jason. Um, Jason is um, a CRNA. He's been practicing in the Bay Area in California. He has uh, been about two years since graduation at Union University in uh, Memphis. He has been a YouTuber and a social media influencer since 2015. Um, he also works with the AANA on the communications committee, advocating for the profession and working to advance CRNA's um, recognition and practice across the US. He also offers mentorship mock interviews through his YouTube channel and membership to help others reach their career goals. So welcome, Jason. It's so nice to have you here. I'm so excited. You're the first guest that we've had on this podcast. <laughs> All right. Thank you for having me on. I feel honored to have me as the first guest of this podcast. Awesome. So we're going to bring to you guys a very um, great topic today. It's one that's probably somewhat difficult to talk about uh, for some, but, and I also, I'm not trying to scare anyone away because this is not common, but I also want to address it because it's not common. And the, the people who do experience this may feel alone. Um, and so I want to make sure that, you know, you're not alone and that there are things you can do to either a best way prevent it, or even some tips of things you can do going to move forward if this were to happen to you. So the topic today is going to be kind of talking about uh, three main reasons that I see SRNAs deal with dismissal and three key things students should know about their program even prior to applying for acceptance or even um, gaining acceptance to their school. Mm -hmm. um, and potentially even some things you can do to kind of um, help yourself out if this were to happen to you. So um, without further ado, we're going to go ahead and get into it. All right, so we are going to cover the number one reason that I see students essentially get dismissed from their anesthesia programs is related to grades. Um, so what would you say is the biggest challenge to Jason? What would you say is the biggest challenge in keeping up with school and getting grades you need to be successful? So you make a great point that grades are very important in CRNA school. And I would say for me personally, in the SRNAs that I went to school with, joining CRNA school is a different level of academic stress and studying and something that pretty much, I don't know anyone who started CRNA school and said, oh, I was prepared for this. Like I was ready to take on this level of, you know, information and speed and difficulty all at once. So trying to focus on keeping ahead of the curve is the biggest thing that I try and recommend students to do when the first day of class, as soon as they start going through the lecture material and study and, you know, addressing different things that you need to study, really just hammer down that information over spend time on it, like spend way more time than you think you're going to need on that first test. If you think, oh, I need 60 hours a week to study, spend 90 hours that week studying, like just pour everything into it, go way over the top. And then when you make a 78 after 90 hours of studying on your first exam, you can be like, oh, damn, this is a lot harder than I thought it was going to be. I need to figure out new ways of studying, but at least you didn't make a 58. And then you're way behind behind the ball. And now you're like struggling to keep up. That's my recommendation. Go shoot for the moon or what is this? this uh, shoot for the stars and land on the moon or yeah. something. Like that. I, essentially do that. I think so. I'm bad at that kind of stuff though, too. <laughs> um, but yeah, I think also the key you guys too, and, and Jason briefly mentioned it was, oh, the, I didn't get the grade I wanted. And I put all this effort into it. Maybe reevaluate your study habits. And I think that's a common thing I see students go into anesthesia school with is they don't have a good study routine and they think they know how to study because maybe all it took an undergrad was reading a book or reading their notes and passing a test. I'm telling you, listen to my previous episode on study techniques. That's really going to help you. It's all about combining various study techniques, not just using one or two. You have to involve all your senses. You have to visualize stuff. You have to hear it. You have to speak it. You have to write it. You have to get your emotions involved. And I promise you, if you do those things, you're going to have better retention for your tests. Um, don't cram. Cram is for short, short term memory. If you want long term memory, you have to, it's, it's the repetition game. It's over and over and over and over. Um, that's the only way. And trust me, you're not going to do yourself any favors by cramming and passing a test. And then boards come and you're freaking out because you spent your entire school cramming for tests. So 
I think that's another good point too. And realistically, as far as actual hours go, this is all individual based, meaning everyone's going to be different. There's no right or wrong hours to put into your work. It's all about what works for you. And a lot of that comes down to how good your study techniques are. The better your study techniques, the less time you have to spend. The worse your study techniques are, the more time you're going to spend. So try to play with it. Take your notes to the gym, listen to a podcast in your car, just try different techniques, whatever works for you. There are so many different ways to absorb knowledge these days. So take advantage of that. But I agree. Um, shoot, shoot for the stars and land among the moon or <laughs> however that saying goes. You want right. to start the bar off high, meaning don't be too. I don't think most students start off school being too casual. I think they're a lot more stressed and, and like, oh, my gosh, I have to ace this test. You know, that's probably the vast majority. Um, mm -hmm. But you kind of want to until you can kind of get a feel for how things are, you want to make sure you're giving it your 110% effort. Um, and you really should honestly do that through your entire schooling, but you know, don't get me wrong. You may go through weeks or months where you're burnt out and you may not have that kind of energy to give to it, but you always have to strive for that. Yeah. And I think you made a really great point. I wanted to reiterate when I said, you know, study, you know, 90 hours a week, whatever, I don't mean study <laughs> 90 hours a week, uh, cramming for like read and writing techniques of studying. I mean, like, just like you said, mix multiple mm -hmm. modes of learning in there because what may have been fine for you in undergrad, like for me in undergrad, I could go to lecture in nursing school and I could listen to the lecture and engage in the lecture. So that was auditory learning for me. And then I could go home and review my notes notes and my PowerPoint slides from the lecture. And I could do that a couple times. And then the morning of the exam, and I pretty much made an A, you know, like I was all I had to do. Mm -hmm. I got into CRNA school and thought I could possibly listen and then read and write some of the material from my notes again. And that was not any, even if you did that 60 hours a week, that's not going to be enough. Like you're going to need to master this content, which will take study groups, you know, podcast, uh, creating study guides, quiz lit, mm -hmm. like multiple different modes, like drawing pictures on a, yes. on a, a whiteboard or whatever and diagrams and stuff, multiple modes of learning and memory and, and learning to master it so that on the test day, you actually have mastered the content and you didn't just try and memorize some things from the book so you could regurgitate it because that won't pass you in CRNA school. Yes, 110%. I agree. Um, and you guys, it's not really the content itself that's so difficult. It's the sheer amount and the fact that they're always tacking on new things. So it's kind of you're building out my, my program director would always say, it's like building a Christmas tree. You start with the base and then you put the branches on, um, you know, so you're always adding more information. So it's, and it's a lot, it's just a lot of information. Um, and then, so one tip for you guys on a way that I want you to know before you enter school, before you gain acceptance. And a lot of times I found out recently, cause I've been Googling, I love Google <laughs> is you can actually find the student handbook on Google from all these programs. Not all of them, but if you can't find it, email the program director and say, hey, would I be able to take a look at your student handbook? I'm interested in applying here. I don't know why they would say no, but the that's the worst thing they could say is no. But if it's, I don't know what's so secretive about it. I mean, it's a student handbook and they want you to read it. Most students probably don't read it, which is unfortunate. Um, right. So get a hold of the student handbook and look at their grading scale. I have come to find that all schools have a different grading scale. And that's surprising to me. And I also think that, again, if you're that student who maybe is a 3.2 student who, you know, is entering a program whose pass rate is 87%, that might be something to really think about long and hard, um, just because, again, you want, you know, to set yourself up for the success. And there are programs whose uh, pass rate is 80%. Okay. As long as you get an 80%. Now it doesn't, I don't know as far as how challenging the courses are. Does that mean that the school has a, that has an 87% benchmark is a little bit easier to get that grade than the 80% benchmark. I don't know. That's impossible for me to know, but I do know like my program allowed one C in an anesthesia course or a core course. And any more than that, you were kicked out. Um, some programs don't allow any C's at all. Like if you get a C at all, you're out. And so knowing these things prior to entering a program, not to scare you away, essentially, but especially if you're that student who has options, meaning if you have school A, B, and C to pick from, it might not hurt to know their grade policy. And again, that's also why you want to look at their attrition rates as well. That can potentially play into that. Um, you know, I do know schools um, are aware of their grading scales and how they do things, and um, but it doesn't change the fact that they're all a little different. So again, knowing these things before you enter the program, I think will really go a long way as far as you being able to kind of 
take more control back to yourself and your own success in graduating uh, these programs. Ask them if they have remediation. Oh. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good idea. Yeah, and these programs, their grades are going to be, their grading scales are going to be based off statistics. There's a reason that they have an 87 or whatever. And they've determined from their students in the past that the majority of the students who score a certain amount in this class pass boards the first time they take it, which is their ultimate goal. That's the whole reason you're there is for them to prepare you to be a CRNA in the way that they know statistically and by a metric that you're prepared is by passing boards the first time you take it. So that's what they're aiming to do. And it actually looks bad on them and can put their program in jeopardy if too many of their students don't pass boards the first time you take it. So you'll find out as you're in school longer, you'll realize a lot of the hoops you're jumping through, including your grades that they want you to do, is all for you to all pass boards first time you take it when you graduate. So if a program says 87% or higher, it means something told them in their stats that that 86 and lower drops your percentage of their students who pass boards first time. So that's where that comes from. So yeah, look at those numbers. That's a really good point, Jenny. Look at those grading scales that these schools want you to have. Yeah, no, yep. And very good point about the board passing rate. That's really what it is all about. And think about, it. about it. They want it. They want to keep those doors open for everyone. How bad would it be to be in a program midway through and then actually have them to close? They'd have to shut down because historically they weren't keeping that board passing rate up and then you don't have a degree and you just completed a year in that program. Right. Um, every five to 10 years, these schools are getting reaccredited. So maybe know when they're due to be reaccredited, especially if it's a program who has a low board passing rate. Um, so, and we'll talk more about that probably in a separate episode because we'll go into that um, as far as how to decipher those stats on schools. Oh yeah, very important point. That, that's a whole podcast. Yeah, that is, it is. Yeah. And actually, I'm, I think I'm gonna have um, Richard Wilson talk the students about that since nice. um, I always tell people you got to hear from the horse's mouth, <laughs> which is the program themselves, you know? Oh, yeah. um, okay. So the second reason that we see students um, essentially get remediated or uh, dismissed from their program is because of clinical performance. Okay. And so Jason, my question for you is, did you have any classmates or yourself that struggled in clinical arena? And if so, why do you think that was? So yeah, I mean, there's always students who are gonna be struggling a little bit more, especially in the first few rotations. We didn't have anybody removed from the program for that, but I do know that it's happened in the past, usually because of someone maybe like abusing a drug or, or like actually clinically doing something very, very harmful and uh, you know out of bounds. So yeah, don't think, don't be so nervous going into clinicals thinking like, oh, you're going to miss too many intubations and they're going to decide <laughs> you're no good and throw you out the door. Like that's not how it works. Uh, but there's all of us struggle in certain elements of the anesthesia process. It just depends on which one you struggle in more. Uh, but yeah, there are some students who just seem to struggle with a majority more of this tasks and they usually just get more help. They get it, usually more um, guiding and uh, mentorship and just kind of working them slowly into it. But I found that probably by third rotation, which our rotations are two months apiece, probably by our third or fourth rotation in, in our first year of clinical rotations, I think everybody was pretty fine. You know, like you all are going to get there. Even if you struggle in the beginning, don't be disheartened and think, oh, you're done for. You will get there. You will do it a, a couple hundred more times until you finally get pretty good at it. Okay. So don't stress. Yes. And I guess I wasn't, this is not even a common reason. By far the most common reason was our number one, uh, which is grades. And so I'm, I'm pointing out the other two because they're way less common, but I just still wanted to point it out because I have known a few students um, that have had issues. And so again, I'm not I definitely don't be afraid. And like Jason said, it's not from not miss getting your A lines or IVs or intubations. It really comes down to a couple of things, attitude. Okay. Um, you know, ad adaptability and accountability. Are you constantly calling off? Not that calling off itself is going to get you removed, but if, if, if a site, if you're always calling in for whatever reason in a particular site, I have had students who were said, well, if they don't, if they can't show up, then they're not welcome to come. Um, and maybe they didn't get kicked out of clinical overall, but they got removed from that site. And that could be a big deal because their, your program may not have another site for you to travel to for your heart rotation. Totally. Um, I had, you know, and just in my class alone, we had a student who, um, was, I don't know, obviously I wasn't there, but I, all I know from, you know, word of mouth was they, they got up fresh, 
frazzled and frustrated while they were trying to do an intubation. Um, and they actually dropped the Mac blade in the patient's mouth and, and chipped the tooth and cut the lip. Um, instead of just nicely removing the Mac blade and cause harm to the patient. And they actually were physically removed from that clinical site because of that event. Um, so a lot of it, again, comes down to attitude and handling criticism and, and keeping your composure. Doesn't mean you have to always agree with your, your preceptor. And don't get me wrong, your preceptor may be, may be wrong. Like they may be being, um, but the appropriate time to handle those situations is not while you're trying to provide patient care. It's after you've safely provided patient care and outside of the OR when you can address these issues with um, the student coordinator or your program director. But again, um, you know, lack of preparation. Okay. You know, if you're going into these clinical sites routinely and you're not prepared, meaning you don't know your drugs, you don't know the mechanism of action, you can't even safely dilute drugs or administer drugs. If you literally show up having no clue, and this happens over and over and over and over, despite someone saying you need to do this, you need to do this. Now, don't get me wrong. Um, they will work with you. They will try because no one wants a student to get removed for this reason. And I have seen students who are really kind of sh pretty, pretty rough around the edges in the beginning, turn into these rock stars. And that's just the most amazing thing to see. And I love seeing that it, mm -hmm. it happens time and time again. Um, and very rarely do you have a student who is not receptive to the extra mentoring, like what Jason said. Um, but eventually what will happen is if you over a period of, you know, eight, nine, 10 months, if, and especially if you do something that could be dangerous, and I mean, dangerous, uh, which is just sheer negligence, essentially, then you could be faced with removal of the program from removal from the program. And again, this is, probably only, not even, I can't even, no one's going to go into school with intentions of doing bad. No one does that. Mm -hmm. um, but I think what happens is these students get burnt out or they get overwhelmed with their classwork and they don't focus on their clinical. And so right. that's what makes it hard too with class, you guys, because it's not just classwork, it's clinical preparation too. That's a whole nother component of the stress and the pressure is you're not only preparing to ace that test, but you're now under the pressure to make sure you're looking up uh, a weight cranny and how to handle a weight cranny and what are some possible complications of that. And, you know, the drugs that you use and the mechanism of action and, and what are the possible side effects of those drugs and what, what to look out for because it caught, you know, so going into your clinical sites, being prepared takes time and preparation. So if just know that, and as long as you take that to heart and don't let your burnout get the best of you when you get to that point, because trust me, you all will get burnout and that's totally human and okay. Um, you got to find a way to push through and still perform in clinical. Um, and again, it's for the patient. You're doing this for the patient, for the safety, and also for your career, because every time you're in clinical, that's a job interview. So. Yeah. Jenny, I like that you brought those points up because while I was saying that I didn't know anyone who got like thrown out of the program over clinical performance, there's a lot of stress that you can bring on yourself. That's undue that you don't need to have if you are performing, like you mentioned, where you're showing up late, you don't know your drugs, you get flustered during your intubation and you like injure the patient, but you know, by chipping a tooth or something like that. Those are all things that definitely do happen. And, you know, hopefully one student is not doing all those things over and over. Cause then that possibly could get you thrown out of the program. Like your program may remove you and, and get rid of you. But I think we, we all have had moments during our clinical training where we were not proud of maybe us showing up late or, you know, maybe getting into a, a slight disagreement or argument with a clinical preceptor or something you may have done or said, where you're like, you left that day and said, that was not my hundred percent. That wasn't everything I should have given it this day. And hopefully it just happens on a rare occasion and it's a learning uh, moment for you and you have enough grace given to you that it's, you're not like heavily penalized. You're able to learn from it and grow, but there are definitely times where if you don't do your preparation and, you know, stay calm and things like that, you will be stressed out and you will have problems in your clinical training that you don't want to face. Mm -hmm. Yep. I agree. And you're right. You're going to have off days. I mean, and you're going to have things that maybe, you know, you kind of use your best judgment. They still don't go right. And then you learn from it afterwards. I'm not taught because that's human. You guys, you're, you're going to have, it's a big, steep learning curve and you're not meant to be perfect. So by, please don't take this the wrong way. I'm not trying to scare anyone. Um, <laughs> but you know, every time I talk to, and I take a lot of students, you know, and I, again, I see students who, um, come unprepared and I see students who come prepared. I see students who don't know something and then they look it up and like, to me, that's, that's, that's a, that's a rock star. If you can not know something, but take the initiative to look it up and get back with me, 
I, that's an A plus plus in my book. I don't care if you know everything I ask you. I don't care if you get every skill. I, I don't, I really don't, but it's more about your attitude and how you move forward from potential things that you could have done better. And like you said, learn from it, grow from it, show up better, you know, and you're going to have a bad day. You're going to have a bad day and maybe a day that you don't feel like being your best. And that's okay. That's called being human. <laughs> yeah. Um, and we're all human. So again, don't, by no means is any of this meant to scare you guys. Um, but just to stress to you guys that if you are, if you maybe are unaware of a problem in clinical, and if it's brought to your attention by your student coordinator or by a preceptor, hear them out, hear them out, listen to them, see what their opinions are. And then not even saying you have to hundred percent agree with them, but at least give them the time to hear them out and think about it. Think about it, just reflect openly on it and move forward from it in a way that's, uh, doesn't hinder you. Um, and if you can do that, and if you can take someone's advice, help and guidance, you are going to be a okay. It doesn't matter how rough you start. You will be okay. You just have to be open to hearing someone else out and what they think you can do better and how they think you can do better. Um, and if you do those things, you're going to be okay. Yeah, totally. Okay. So that's number two. And again, by far the most common reason is grades, you guys, but I had to mention the clinical performance because it does occasionally happen. Um, okay. So we went over the tips. So reason number three, so this reason number three is that students tend to either leave the program or for whatever reason, don't finish tends to be because school or clinical was not what they expected. And they came kind of essentially unprepared for the commitment. So, um, my question to you, Jason, is what can you say towards being prepared for the commitment of school and what to expect in the clinical arena? Yeah, I, I definitely think you're right on that. Uh, not being prepared for quite how difficult and how much time commitment this is going to be is what some students face. And some of the people that I went to school with, there were at least two out of my class who, who ended up withdrawing in, at the end of first year because they just didn't realize it was going to be this much work, this hard, this much time away from family, this much time you know, going to clinical rotations and things like that. And um, the mental strain on it, they just didn't quite understand like the mental and physical emotional strain that's also going to be it's not like going to nursing school or any other kind of, you know, schooling you probably have done before. So yeah, I mean, you have to luckily you have podcasts like this one, mm -hmm. where we tell you in advance, you know, people in the years past did not have this, they did not have anyone like giving you just a very candid response of CRNAs who are practicing who can tell you reflecting like it is going to be very difficult. And so now you have that to mentally kind of prepare yourself. I, I really think you have to order your life into a certain organization before school begins. You have to decide like my life, my personal life needs to be in order. My finances need to be somewhat in order. You know, my family life needs to be in order. If you're in the middle of a messy divorce or you're in a crumbling marriage that's like verging on divorce or something and you got two kids and you're pregnant and just all these different things are happening you're you're like house is going into bankruptcy and all this stuff is going on in your life now's not the year to apply to crna school like just don't it's not a good time you need to get some of your things in order i'm not saying that it would be impossible for you ever to pass school but i'm saying you're putting a lot of stress and barriers on you being successful as a student with all these other distractions in your life so try and get your life on some kind of track some kind of order and uh, i actually when i do mock interviews uh through my youtube channel i will ask students in the mock interview like about their personal life are, are you married do you have kids or do you live near campus are you planning to work while you're in crna school and these are all really relevant questions that engage in the social aspect of people's lives that will 100 percent affect your performance as a student in these programs because it does require so much of your time and your energy if if you have all this other chaos going on in your life around you, it's going to be really hard for you to successfully focus on CRNA school being your number one in your life. Yeah. And I think you guys not to even scare, Hey, and I'm pregnant by the way, <laughs> I still <laughs> manage to work enough. and juggle a business. So I like, and like Jason said, it's doable, but that being said, I also have an amazing support system at home. Like I, I know I couldn't do what I'm doing and being pregnant bringing our third kid in the world and do everything I'm doing. If my husband was not so supportive and amazing and hands-on and just all that stuff. And so I really, and same thing, like he said, if you're already in a bad relationship prior to school starting, I mean, think about it. You see in the ICU all the time. Do you see a already dysfunctional family go into the ICU and be functional? 
No, in fact, it's way worse. Like Jerry Springer, it's, it's yeah. really bad, you know? So you put dysfunction under stress and it causes more dysfunction. Yeah. So really, and it doesn't mean that every relationship has to be pitch picture perfect. I mean, that's sometimes un, un even realistic actually. <laughs> um, but it does mean you should take some time to discuss and communicate with each other prior to school starting and even seek out counts like therapy, uh, couples therapy prior to school. Trust me, it will it will help you so much as you go forward because communication is key in relationships. And, you know, again, they have to be understanding of what you're getting ready to go through the commitment that you're going to be making and how things at home are going to change. You're not going to be the one always grocery shopping. You're not going to be the one always doing all the cleaning. There's going to be nights you're going to be working till seven, eight o'clock at night. And that means you're not going to help the kids with bath or bedtime. And so again, having all these things kind of discussed openly with your spouse, your partner, ahead of time is really going to save you from the arguments when you're already tired and grouchy and, and stressed, you know, cause when you're, if you get in that argument in the moment when you're stressed and grouchy, well, then you're going to be like, rat, you know, and maybe oh, call yeah. names and then it just escalates, you know? Um, mm -hmm. so yeah, dealing with these things prior to school. So my tip to you guys is thoroughly research this career path. And this is also why shadowing is key. You want to job shadow because you want to know what you're getting yourself into students who go into the clinical arena and are like, oh gosh, this is not what I expected. It's probably because I didn't spend enough, or spend enough time researching this career path prior to going into school. And who wants to spend all this time and money and not to mention stress applying to CRNA school only to get to the clinicals and realize this is not what I thought it was. Um, so please take that initiative. And I, this year has been hard. COVID has sucked for so many reasons, but one of them also being that these poor students have not had a way to actually job shadow, which is so unfortunate. And yes, people have tried to create virtual shadowing experiences, including myself for my students, where I sit and talk to you for three hours about the day in the life of a CRNA and try to be as thorough as possible. But it still does not replace you being in the OR, getting that experience and seeing firsthand what they do. You really, really need that if you can. Um, you know, and just talk to as many CRNAs as you can as well. Get various opinions on what do they like about their jobs? What do they not like about their jobs? Um, what did they like about, what, what was school like for them? And just really taking, researching, getting involved in communities like the ANA, your state PACs, prior to getting into anesthesia school, I promise you, you will be able to find an event you can attend. Um, Canada just had one, the California Association of Nurse Anesthetists just had an event for all students, even RNs. Um, to come learn about what it's like to be a, a SRNA, a, a student nurse resident. Um, there's always opportunities out there. You just have to look for them. And then also setting realistic expectations. And like he said, the time commitment's one of them. Um, <laughs> knowing that you're not going to be able to probably make every kid's baseball game, knowing that you're, or if you do, you're maybe bring your lecture notes with you in your ear pot and your earbuds and just cheer on from the sidelines while you're listening to your lecture. You can still be present. You can still do things. You can still have a life. Um, I know I drank a lot of alcohol in school. <laughs> I don't think that was a good thing, um, but I still had fun with my classmates. We would go out, we would go out after class and have a little happy hour session before one of us would drive us, that wasn't drinking by the way, would drive us home to where we lived. And so I still had fun. School wasn't all stressful. Me and my husband went to Puerto Rico for a week when I was in school. Um, and that was a great bonding. That was like a year into school. And then that was a great way for me and my husband to bond again, you know, and forget about the stress of school. But you better believe I had my, my bearish and my Nagel how on my lap on that airplane. I was studying on the airplane. I took it to the beach. I was reading my notes on the beach. Um, it was still the beach. I'll take it. I'll read anesthesia on the beach any day. Um, so right. it was a vacation, but I still studied on my vacation. And so it wasn't like right. I just took a whole week and just completely forgot about my priorities, which was anesthesia school. I can't tell you how many times I had to say no to events. My husband would be like, Hey, Jenny, we got invited to this, or can we do that? And I would have to, I just get angry at him for even asking me. Cause I'm like, you know, the answer is no, mm -hmm. I don't, I feel bad saying no. I don't want to say no. I actually want to do that, but I right. can't. And you had to be really picky and choosy about what you said yes to. Um, so that kind of hurts after a period of time where you're like, man, I'm that, I'm that Debbie Downer. <laughs> you know, I'm the yeah. one who is like, no, can't do it. Sorry guys. Yeah. Um, and it does suck, but knowing that it's temporary is what will get you through. Um, and then falling back on your classmates and lean on them for support because you, no better person to support you through school than your classmates. And it's because they're in it with you. They know how bad it sucks and how hurtful it could be sometimes and how painful it can be. Um, they know what it's like to not have a good day in clinical as much as you have a compassionate partner or spouse 
they just don't understand sometimes the stress that you're under. And I remember being too exhausted to even talk to my spouse about my day. Sometimes I'd want to come home and just cried out and I would hide my, my tears by sh- crying in the shower. So I couldn't tell I came out crying and then I would try to chip her up for the rest of the evening. And then I would go do it again the next day. And it was not because I didn't want to share it with him, but it was because it was going to hash up feelings again. I didn't want to even talk to him about what, cause I don't even know why I was stressed. I was just stressed. It wasn't like anything happened. I was just overwhelmed. I was just overwhelmed. And so I just need to cry. Um, maybe you need to punch a punching bag, get a little punching bag for your bedroom. I don't know. However you relieve your stress. Um, it will be like this. So having realistic expectations of the amount of stress you're getting ready to go through is key, but knowing it's temporary, knowing that you're not alone, knowing that if you need help, seek it out. Don't wait till you are at your wits end and you're breaking, seek out help from your classmates, from your spouse, from your program director. I had issues in one clinical site with someone who was supposed to be my superior, who treated me pretty poorly and actually would make me cry in clinical and laugh at me actually when I would cry and told me I was too nice and told me that I didn't have the backbone to be a CRNA. Like literally as I'm a student trying to be successful, tell me I couldn't do CRNA that I didn't, I was just too nice of a person and that I couldn't stand up for myself. And that hurt, that hurt. And it didn't make me want to do CRNA less, but it really did make me question things. And unfortunately I had to, I had to bring that up to my program director and think I'm glad I did because they had my back 110% and they helped me, I guess, essentially deal with that event. And, you know, my, my classmates were the same way. And so, you know, lean on that for support, knowing that this journey is going to be difficult, no matter who you are or what you think you're coming into this with, but knowing that it's going to be temporary and the rewarding career that lays afterwards is totally worth it. (laughs) Um, I've never met a CRNA who doesn't love their career. So even though school is rough and maybe it might have some PTSD afterwards, it'll it's, it's worth it. And, you know, you just have to be realistic about what you're getting ready to go into. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I guess with that, Jason, my question, um, what advice can you give to a newly accepted SRNA who is nervous about starting their program? Uh, well, I mean, things like this are good, like podcasts. I mean, looking into podcasts like this, Instagram, social media, Jenny's, you know, got a really great Facebook group that has tons of great information, candid information from other people. And you can join into communities that are also in that same excitement phase of people who are just wanting, they just got their acceptance letter. And now they're yet, you know, in five months, they start their program and they don't know what to do and they want to, you know, talk about it. So those are really great ways, outlets to kind of connect with the community. And it calms your nerves a little bit, helps you realize everybody's going through this the same way yes. you are. They're all nervous. I got a message on Instagram the other day from a guy saying I he took a position at a program. He got accepted. It's, I think it was New York. And he lives like 2,000 miles away from there. And he's super nervous. He's going to leave his family and all his friends and everything behind and move to a whole new place. And so scared and he's even like debating about backing out of it like he's almost afraid just to go forward with it i I just told him like relax everybody has these fears and anxieties you're about to step into a whole new thing you know get connected in a community like just understand that you're not alone in this it is a big step it is really an important step but you're never going to get anything great in life without a little bit of a gamble of taking a step of faith and saying like this is scary to me but i'm going to do this anyway So I recommend kind of getting into that mindset. Another thing a lot of students try and do is research. They want to learn everything they can about anesthesia before the program begins. And it's the typical type A personality that most of us have that we want to be. We already want to be CRNAs by the time we start CRNA school so that we know all the information already. It's just not realistic. It's not going to happen. Even like an intro stuff like Jenny actually offers a couple good uh, educational opportunities through her CRNA prep academy where she tries to give you, she tries to break down some like very simple one-on-one information, yes. right? Yes. And a lot of it's ICU knowledge, um, actually yeah. that, tr- that translates into the realm of anesthesia. Yeah. And that's good. I mean, if you want to do that, that's awesome. But as far as like trying to like go buy the Miller textbook <laughs> and like research it and understand it, it's just not going to be useful to you. It's probably going to stress you out or you may actually learn the information incorrectly, like start mm. getting in your head wrong and then struggle when you actually start having, you have to like unlearn the way you thought that the material was meaning. So yeah, Good I point. recommend take a vacation, enjoy some free time, 
do a little bit of maybe some ICU knowledge, like what Jenny offers, where it's kind of strengthening those, those muscles that you already have built as an ICU nurse that are going to help you begin your ICU or your uh, anesthesia training. But I mean, you're about to have three years of not much fun and free time. So really try and take this time to enjoy some vacations, enjoy time with family, you know, take pictures of it and put it on your wall. So you can remember it throughout the three <laughs> years that you're at your desk. You'd be like, that's right. I remember I went to Hawaii. I looked at this picture of me in Hawaii every day in CRNA school that hung above my desk when I was studying. And I was like, I used to have fun. I remember Aww. these days I, before this stress. And you know what? Here I graduated. Eventually I had fun again. Well, yeah. pandemic hit, but well. one day I'll have fun again. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> one day. But uh, but yeah, so I, that's what I recommend people to do. What about you, Jenny? Yeah, I think that's all great advice. And I love that your picture Hawaii. That's awesome. What I actually had on my desk that kind of kept me motivated through my burnout days was my acceptance letter. Um, you know, don't I did we did take a vacation. We went to uh, Yosemite Park right before I started school. Me and my husband did, and that was phenomenal. I hope to go back sometime soon. Um, but I kept my acceptance letter. And so when I'd have my days where I was like, oh, I don't know if I can do this, this is so awful. How am I going to get through this? Can I, can I find the energy to keep pushing through? I would look at that acceptance letter and say, yes, Jenny, you, you will, because look at what, I mean, you worked this hard to get where you are. There's no turning back. There is, there's, there's just not, you wanted this so bad. And I would find that passion again, that fire of like, I want this more than, more than anything. And so I would push through, um, but I think it's important, like you said, put things in your office that kind of remind you there's a light at the end of the tunnel, that school is only temporary, that you're making a big sacrifice for the long-term gain. Um, I think that that's a very, very important, but, you know, yes, I agree. You know, I think starting your journey, you, you definitely want to find ways to relax and enjoy yourself, talk. And like I said, have those conversations with family and friends. Don't leave out your family and friends. You want them to know the responsibilities you're getting ready to undertake as well. So they don't always ask you to come home for every weekend birthday party, knowing that you can't do that. Um, and knowing that, uh, no, it doesn't mean you don't want to. It just means that that's the expectation you're setting going forward for a while. Um, but yeah, I think, you know, and not to were you, because again, you will have some fun in school. It's not that school's all not fun. It's just different. It's just different. Um, the time I, I think back to my time now in school and I'm like, I had so much time, <laughs> you know, cause I now where I am in my life, I have, we're going to have three kids. You know, I have a business. I work part-time. I was working full-time juggling a business. I mean, we haven't seen a movie or Netflix show in over a year and a half. And mm -hmm. to be honest with you, I don't even have any interest anymore in watching TV or Netflix or anything because I mean, maybe I do. Okay. So I'm lying. I do. I do. Look for, I do look forward to the day to be able to sit on my couch with my husband and relax and drink wine and like watch a mindless TV show, but we're not, that's not our season. We're not in season for that. Uh, maybe when we get our kids through needing their, you know, needing dressed and butt wipes, you know, maybe we can get there. <laughs> um, but I'm okay to give that up for now. The sacrifice I'm making now is for long-term gain. So <clears throat> kind of have that mentality going in and, you know, you'll get yourself through all the hard times. But, you know, as far as knowledge goes, yes, that's a very common thing. People say, well, what can I learn now? And, and he's, and Jason's right. You can't really learn anesthesia out of context. It's, you have to have context for learning anesthesia. I'm not saying don't go get yourself a Duke's anesthesia secrets book or a pocket anesthesia book and maybe skim through it. Or, um, you know, there's, but probably what's going to be more beneficial than actually learning anesthesia itself are other key things that you've already learned before, like pathophysiology, pharmacology, um, chemistry, physics, things that you maybe have already kind of touched on in your undergrad career. That's what you should be brushing up on, not trying to learn the blood gas coefficient of sevoflurane. Okay. Like wait till school for that. <laughs> Um, you know, so right. the kind of courses we do inside Syrian High School Prep Academy are uh we're getting ready to do an SRNA boot camp, which is gonna do like the history of anesthesia. We're gonna do intro to anesthesia topics, intro, and I mean intro, and then we're gonna hit chemistry, physics, uh, pharmacology. And these are all things that are gonna be like refresher courses from your time in undergrad. Um, you know, but that's probably if I had to put my time anywhere and you guys um go back to my resource guide that I just posted um in the previous podcast episode that has uh, the ultimate resource guide. And I listed all kinds of YouTube channels on there um, that have ICU knowledge for free <laughs> on YouTube. It's amazing. You could go brush up on your chemistry with Khan Academy. You can go learn anatomy with, um, you know, Ken Hub. I mean, there's so much out there for free that you can be utilizing right now if you really want to get a head start. Um, so that's my tip for you. There's nothing wrong with getting a head start, but just make sure you're being practical about it and not actually trying to learn anesthesia itself. 
All right. Well, I think that was a great podcast episode, Jason. Thank you so much. I loved it. Thank you for having me on. I think this is going to be one of my favorite podcasts going forward. I'm (laughs) tuned in. Yeah. Well, we'll have to have you back on. So um, again, I appreciate your time and your willingness to share with others. You guys check out Jason Bolt's uh, YouTube channel. Again, he does mock interviews. He does mentoring. He's amazing. He works with the ANA and advocates for this profession. Uh, So definitely he's someone you want to follow. So again, check him out. Jason Bolt will be posting his um, YouTube link in the show notes for you guys to make it easier and your IG account. Um, But yeah. All right. Well, you have a good evening, Jason. All right. Thanks so much. See you later, Jenny. All right. See you later.